Next up um, for our uh, Ag Emerge Talks is going to be uh, Scott Park. He's a farmer, an organic farmer, uh, that I met through Jeff Mitchell. I uh, appreciate the introduction, Jeff, on, on that. And he's uh, done a lot of work with uh, regenerative agriculture on a work group here in California. Uh, we were on a mutual phone call discussion, I think, with Chico State and what they're trying to do with uh, regenerative agriculture. And we, we pushed, didn't we? We tried for some uh, integrated livestock, but uh, that's just a little too crazy out here yet, Gabe. So we're, we're working, you know, but you know how this works with the universities. They, they, they'll come along once we've done it for a while. So, oh, sorry, Jeff, did I say that? <laughs> so anyway, uh, but no, Scott's done some uh, really innovative things on his family farm and looking forward to hearing what he has to share. Scott Park. Thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to throwing some thoughts out to you. Our farm is run a little different than, uh, and that's why I made the title of a normal California farm farmed abnormally. Is that uh, most farms in California, if you live here, you've seen it. And if you've come, you've seen that, that most of the fields are bare, naked, sterile, dead, lifeless. And, uh, and that this is the standard of row crop and field crop farming. And it's been going on when I started, I'm first generation, okay? I have a degree in political theory. And uh, that's, uh, so I've definitely gone through the bumps of learning somewhat how to be a farmer. But when I started in 1974, this, this was the ideal. The fields looked like this whatever, however many years ago that is, 45 years, and, uh, and they're still looking exactly the same. To support what Rod was saying last night about the ag cycle, that's the ag cycle. Uh, that's the ag cycle in row crop and field crops in California. So that's what I know. I'm not gonna deal any in orchards, and I'm not gonna deal any with dairy, because I, I don't know anything on that, although we do wanna bring grazing into into our operation. So on our farm, my wife has played a critical role in finances. She's basically run all the numbers for 45 years. And my son's been farming with me, Brian, for the last 12. And fortunately, Brian farms with a passion and enthusiasm that I've had. And, and I'm looking to slow down. And as, as I found out through the last few years, the last less that I inject myself on the farming practices and the more Brian does the more money we make okay so I'm either a lousy farmer or a great teacher <laughs> and uh, so that's this is our farm this is one of our fields and this is what we shoot for and in this field is these fields are growing amongst the desert the brown deserts okay and, and it's also somewhat fascinating that we've been doing this now pretty aggressively in 1989 30 years ago we started planting cover crops 1985 we really started or I started realizing that I was going down a dead end and that I needed to get something going on to make the soil grow better and I have to say honestly Rod was talking about these you know plants I did not have a clue what I was doing okay I, I have a little clue now better after 45 years, but a lot of what's occurred on, on our farm has just been serendipitous, only knowing what not to do, but not necessarily what to do. And, and, and in the long run, it's worked out really well as, as we inch along. So I'm gonna give you a quick history and, and a little touch on our practices that we do in order to accomplish this trying to farm as thoughtfully with the key being soil health and the soil health is the foundation of our farm, and it's, the, it, it's what drives all our decision making. And, and we just believe, and we're seeing the results, that we want diversity, and we want more diversity in the future, but we get diversity in cover crops in our crop rotation. We want life in the soil. We shoot for 365 days a year, but it never happens. And, and, and we also shoot for minimum tillage, the least amount of tillage that we possibly can do. So what's happening with that through time is, is, is some of the examples that I'll hit on. And, and I think some of them are, are pretty spectacular and others are just nudging the envelope. Um, 
this is the uh, this is one of the farms where uh, one of the fields the crops this is rice jasmine rice this has not had any input other than cover crops for two years the yield on this crop was 9700 bags compared to an average conventional rice yield of maybe 85 somewhere in there depending on the year so these are things that were, were, were this is serendipitous this is we're planning this the company is going god we really like to have the purest rice we can possibly have we're doing it and, and we're getting some amazing results with no inputs so uh, quickly the history on the farm we farm 50 miles north of sacramento okay we have about 1700 acres that we're farming 1974 we started leasing 300 acres still most of the land we have is leased is is it's been a grind to get where we're at uh, of these acres we have 27 fields spread over 10 miles we grow 10 to 20 different crops the reason we grow each crop is to make a buck but also matching a crop rotation cover crops what have you that it's helping the next crop because one of the things that, that again we found out just through luck is we have almost no insect or disease pressure the, the the system that we're using is doing spectacular results on letting mother nature the soil do all our work as far as having to apply any any organic insecticides and just as a side note one of the things that drove this is the way we moved is my first going organic my mentality was, oh, we have a problem, just go grab a jug, John. And, uh, but, but even organic insecticides, the only thing good about them is they're not as toxic as, 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 uh, as conventional. But they're just glorified water, and, and they, they, they accomplish nothing. And so what, what we did without really knowing what we were doing is we had to start figuring out how to solve a problem before it happens. Because in organic, once it happened, it's too late. Okay, so, so don't even put yourself exposed to it. And, and so that was through time and, and experience, that's the system we've designed. We aren't depending on putting any input in the field once the crop's planted. In fact, our inputs for growing 20 different crops from high value crops that are, that are bringing in grosses of over 5,000 an acre to compost cover crops, um, uh, uh, microbials and seaweed and the microbials in the seaweed we add when we plant a, as a drancher with the seed that's it for growing all these crops that's the only input we do all season long we are depending on the health of the soil to to take care of all other problems oops let's see um, so I've spoke a bit to, to classes. Jeff Mitchell has brought up his classes. Jeff Mitchell is by far one of the best things happening to California agriculture for caring about how we move forward. If you're talking about breaking paradigms, Jeff's the one in the university system who cares and busts his butt to do, to get into everything that he can get into to help us farm better and not be farming the way we are. So speaking to like Jeff's classes, I came up with these seven C's. That's what we do. That's the basis. That's the practice and principles of our farm. The seven C's are cover crops, crop rotation, conservation tillage are the three key. And we are also crop residue, compost, controlled traffic, and conserving inputs. So those seven, that's, that's the nexus. That's, that's what our, the way that our system works to keep it the way it is. So in this picture here, it shows some of the seven C's. This is a rice crop. That's what all that straw is. And that tractor's running on control traffic. It's running on sub one inch. It's on the same furrows that it ran on um, 10 years ago, actually, in this field. We're planting a cover crop. That's what's behind there. We have a no-till planter going. Crop residue, it's all there. We never bale or burn anything. Conserving inputs, we work the ground just enough that, that we can make the furrows. As the, the, any of you who aren't around row crops, if I'm referencing, that's a furrow, that's a bed, uh, just to be on the safe side. So, Okay, so in here, we work the ground enough. In, in the compost side, the compost is already, that's the first thing we put on. We find we get a symbiotic relationship. We get a little better results whenever we take biomass and put that with the compost together if we mix it into the soil. 
So what results have we gotten from farming this way? Well, this is a, actually, a, a, this is 65 ton tomatoes, tomatoes 65 ton to the acre crop. Um, this was grown under studies by UC um, Davis. I've done a lot of stuff with UC Davis. And this was also a field where the water was cut off 45 days before harvest. Okay, just you're not dealing in tomatoes. So numbers wise, conventional, a good conventional crop is 50 tons. Okay, so this is going 65. A normal conventional crop irrigates almost from the day it's planted until a week, maybe 10 days before harvest. Okay, this went 40 days after planting without turning any water in and had water turned off 45 days before harvest. The tomato growing season is about 125 days. So we basically, a third of the season, we irrigated. And we irrigate a lot at that time. The plants are growing like crazy. So we lay the water in there at that time. But we're still, our water usage has dropped considerably because of the ability of the soil to hold the water and to have the proper soil structure. It's not just holding water, but it's also the aeration and the root system, the development. Is, the water is just one part of the whole package of having the soil in the correct condition. We also put on 10 to 15 tons of biomass every year. So in that, that 10 to 15 tons, the variance is like you grow tomatoes, you get very little biomass afterwards. But it's crop residue, compost, and cover crops. And so every field, every acre, every year is, is getting that put at them. Okay, so that combined with trying to get something growing 365 days a year, you know, I watch Gabe's, you know, Gabe totally blows me away. I mean, that's, the, he's, 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 he's the boss. But, but you know, we're trying the best we can in a California environment to, to try to get in time maybe somewhere close to where Gabe's at. So this is uh, also on quality, like we're picking up buyers that want to buy our product because our quality is high. We're, we're really proud of the nutrient density. The numbers on it still are not very good, but UCD is them doing that tomato trials. They're finding that like phenols and antioxidants are way higher in, in our tomatoes than they are like in conventional tomatoes. So we're getting that nutrient density kick, which I think all farmers should be considerate of. I'm gonna go over that one tomorrow. This one, uh, and you're not supposed to look at that yet. Okay, so also I, I mentioned we don't like in four years we've sprayed some sulfur for mites, okay, on 30 acres. And on a bean field, we had to put on some Grandivo for um, aphid like back two years ago. But, but other than that, so this is on 27 fields, 20 different crops a year over the last four years. That's it. You know, that's for all insect herbicides disease, never, nothing. That, we're, we're just planting it and letting it grow. Okay, so I'm talking the talk. And I'm talking like this to a UCD professor. And she goes, eh, can you walk the walk? And I'm what do you mean? She's going, well, let's, let's run a test. Let's see. So she took, got a grant from California Tomato Research Institute. And they took five-gallon buckets of soil from our fields and then five-gallon buckets from four fields around University of California, Davis. They grew out tomato plants in it for 40 days. Then they took and covered the plants with a net, okay? And then they stuck 400 beet leaf hoppers inside the net to see, because the beet leaf hoppers, one, they're horrible for San Joaquin. They cause uh, curly top virus. And, and so it's really important in that sense of seeing what this was gonna do. But, but anyway, it's really easy to see if the beet leaf hoppers are working as they leave an, an indentation, as they, as they, pack, they hit and, and inject the virus. So the, anyway, they ran it for 40 days, they took the cover off, and then they checked hits on the plants. So needless to say, I wouldn't show this little slide if I didn't come out looking good, okay? So, but that's, that's it. I mean, even the closest one I, my, our fields were 90% better, and then the others were, what, 250, 300% better. And, and so then they took, they, did, they, uh, they replicated this three times, got same results, then they took the soil, they took my soil, and they, they just took half of it and sterilized it. And then they grew it out again in sterilized soil, and then in my regular soil, got the exact same results. And so then, now they're studying, and it's given off an acid, it starts with acid, 
you know, past two syllables on dead meat. And, and, but, but anyway, they're finding that between the plant, the roots, and, and the microbial life, there's an, a saprophilic, something like that, acid, that goes up to the tomato leaf, it gives it off, the beet leaf hopper goes, whoo, no thank you. And, and that's, what, that's the way the system's working. So, the, you know, progress like this, you know, as we talk about the jugs, this is how we get rid of the jugs. This, this, to me, this is a super big deal. So also on, on the way we're farming, yes, we do see dirt. Uh, I, I'm, we're trying to have less dirt. But still, in California farming environment, like in here, this is a corn crop. We took the corn crop off. We chopped it. We spread compost. We made one pass to mix the compost in so we're not losing it with a rain for it going to the sky. And we planted wheat. Like this is what the field looked like two weeks ago. Um, this is a minimalist approach, just that, that as I talk about less water, less nitrogen, less tillage, less plants, most, mostly because I'm running fast or I'm running out of time. If you look at the plant population, you're going to go, wow, that's not very good. We plant single row, only 7,000 plants per acre compared to normal farms that plant 9,000 plants on two rows per bed. And, and yet we yield equivalent but we don't fight all kinds of diseases and problems because we don't trust our soil to take care of the, of the crop. So we got to pump it full of water. We got to pump it full of nitrogen. We got to have a whole bunch of plants in order to make up for our insecurities that the soil can't do what it's supposed to do. So crust, this is crust. Uh, I'm not, uh, we're running, I'm running short. Uh, all I want to point out is I just broke that with a shovel. Yeah, I'm not into crust. This was underwater for two weeks. If you can imagine farmers, clay ground underwater for two weeks, how that would be set up like a brick. This is about as thick as your fingernail, okay? And it's done for, I'll, I'll touch on this tomorrow, because we grow rice completely different than anyone else to beat a bunch of problems. And the key is having soil that doesn't create a crust. Soil that's friable and, and aggregate, it has aggregations. This is water retention. Both fields I was farming. The field on the left, the farmer is going broke growing rice. He asked me to come in and turn it into organic. 2017, heavy rains. Okay, the field on the left, we just transitioned in the fall of 2016. Both fields followed rice. Both fields had a cover crop planted. I worked the field. I had complete control of it. That's the field on the left. Cover crop completely drowned out. Field on the right, I've been farming for 10 years with cover crops the whole, sh the whole show. No water leaving the field, cover crop alive. I'm going to, this is just drilling into moist, drilling rice without tilling the ground. This is another example of, of resiliency, of margin of air. I almost see it if you take care of the soil. That's your crop insurance. 2017 again, very wet. <coughs> Field on the left, another farmer. He had to dist up part of it. 50 acres, he got one truckload. We had a field, same thing along the Sacramento River about a mile away. We got five truckloads. It was 70 acres, but it was still like a four to one ratio. Only difference was taking care of your soil. So last, we're going to have regulatory, <laughs> regulatory tidal wave coming at us farmers. We either take care of the problems ourselves, or we have the government telling us what to do. I'm extremely independent. I do not want that happening. Okay, I want to work with the Sacramento Valley cattle. I want to have geese. I want to use anything that helps us farm better and farm with the flow instead of imposing ourselves on nature and, and thinking that we know better. So as it is, we're getting better. We change every year. We're an evolving company. If I give this talk two years from now or my son gives it two years from now, I, I'm sure it's going to be different than what it is. You know, we're, we're, we're taking things in and we're trying to improve every year. We certainly are moving faster than this farmer who failed to keep up with his farm, okay? So anyway, it's exciting times for park farming and thank you very much.